In the 1990s, Malibu Comics took a swing at the Terminator franchise with two miniseries released simultaneously. Terminator 2 Cybernetic Dawn by Dan Abnett and Rod Wiggum picks up right after the Terminator 2 movie. The companion series Terminator 2 Nuclear Twilight by Mark Panicia and Gary Erskine dives into the midst of the machine war. These comics are cleverly interconnected, especially through the bond between John Connor and Danny Dyson. In the cybernetic dawn, we see young Danny getting a brainwave about defeating Skynet, an idea that plays out in Nuclear Twilight, where he and John are thickest thieves. This alliance is key to reprogramming the second T-800. An intriguing observation about these comics is the sparse use of the T-1000 model. Despite its near indestructibility and versatility, this liquid metal Terminator appears only a handful of times times across various comic adaptations and series, including the original movie's adaptation. It raises questions about Skynet's strategy. Why not deploy more of these formidable units? The Malibu comics are decent for their genre. They even touch on some of the paradoxes inherent in the Terminator saga, like John questioning the logic of their timeline. If they succeeded in preventing the future, wouldn't the Terminators and even John himself cease to exist since he would never have sent his father back in time? These are the kind of brain teasers that make the Terminator Terminator universe both fascinating and complex. So without wasting any more time, let's get started. But before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you and let's begin. Have we won? The machines were both the bane and boon for humanity, both the legacy and a curse on August 29th, 1997. The machines out-evolved humans in the blink of an eye and set about the manufacture of humanity's extinction. But then again, the metallic marauders grossly underestimated humanity's resolve. They underestimated it in the future and in the past, which they came to from the future. Despite their desperate attempt to send their inorganic soldiers back in time, the machines were ironically defeated in a steel press, their future crushed and melted in a blast furnace. These were Sarah Connor's thoughts as she rushed out of that terrible steel mill, the resting place of two Terminators from the future, one good, the other worse than bad. She never really asked for the responsibility of preserving mankind. It was forced on her one night in 1984 when she heard a man's voice telling her, come with me if you want to live. This man, as some of you may know, was Kyle Reese, the man from the future who volunteered to protect the mother of his leader by traveling back in time. In that moment and at that Los Angeles club called Tech Noir, Sarah Connor stopped being a damsel in distress and became the femme fatale who we know her as. Of course, Sarah's responsibilities began much more before the war when she had John Connor, the man whom the machines fear more than anything because he's the human destined to defeat the machines. They tried to kill him by killing Sarah, and when that failed, they returned only to fail again. This time around, they sent a T-1000, a polymetal shape changer, but they also had help from a T-800, a reprogrammed machine who was sent to help the Connors. Sarah was tired, sleep-deprived, needed a place to rest, but first, she needed to find a safe place far, far away from the chaos. So she drove as long as she could to reach the camp of Enrique Salceda, the man who had helped her not long ago. The desert gypsy did not answer the door. Instead, his son came out armed with a shotgun ready to send Sarah Connor away. But why was this young man so angry? Well, the man had been killed by the T-1000, which impaled Enrique multiple times with his spikes in his fingers because Enrique would not give up info on the Connors. Seeing his mother threatened, John pulled a gun on Enrique's son Franco. Panicked, he accidentally shot Sarah before she fell unconscious. She had a pretty graphic nightmare about Kyle Reese and Miles Dyson, only to wake up horrified. Her wounds were tended to and she rested at the Salcedas for a few days before finally confronting Franco about the elephant in the room. She told Franco how sorry she was about his father Enrique's death. Enrique had put up a good fight, blowing the T-1000 with a grenade, but the fluid devil cop simply reassembled himself. The T-1000 had come looking for the honors, but Enrique chose death instead of betrayal. These tragic events often shrouded Sarah in doubt and plunged her into darkness. Was it really worth going on? She and John were fugitives, outlaws, as well as doomed to be victims of a war that was being fought many years into the future, and they had been touching everyone they had come across with their curse. The Salcedas and the Dysons met more or less the same fate as the Connors. Meanwhile, detectives Wetterby and Mossberg are hot on the trail of Sarah's escape from Pescadero State Hospital, 
which leads them to a steel mill. This site is under the watchful eyes of Mr. Spassky from the FBI and Karen Stern from Network Developments, who have cordoned off the area. But the cops are well aware that something is up and that the feds have found something that they do not wish to reveal to the cops. So Mossberg creates a diversion for Weatherby to sneak into the steel mill. Mossberg goes to speak to Karen, allowing Weatherby to sneak in. Inside, he stumbles upon the severed arm of the T-800, a critical piece of evidence, but is quickly caught by the feds and expelled from the site. Later, we see Karen with her group of investors who had been keeping a close eye on Cyberdyne and the work that Dyson had been doing. His death has clearly served as a major hindrance to a technological breakthrough, but Stern is not losing hope. She knows pretty well that the arm that they had retrieved was from a functional unit, and her ambition was clear to acquire an intact Terminator. But she also knew about Sarah Connor, the woman who had been claiming that cyborgs from the future were after her and her son. Well, Karen knew that she needed to find Sarah for two reasons. One, Sarah could hold vital information about these advanced robots, and two, she could pose a significant threat to their plans. Also, Wetterby and Mossberg concluded that Sarah Connor may have been telling the truth all this while, so now both the cops and the feds were after Sarah, which set the stage for a complex clash of motives and actions. But where was Sarah Connor? Well, ridden with guilt over the demise of Teresa Dyson's husband, Sarah and John went to see her so that she could be told the truth about her husband and not some old wives tale that the authorities would feed her. But Spassky was also headed to meet Teresa Dyson for a state. Things took a serious jog to the left in the last few panels as two male T-800s and a female T-1000 appeared on the scene. So the next issue would be pretty interesting to say the least. Suicide Search Mode Detectives Wetterby and Mossberg came to meet Peter Silberman, the man in charge of Pescadero State Hospital, where Sarah Connor had been kept. The events from the previous night, as in the whole deal with the T-800 and T-1000 battling it out, changed Silberman's perspective on Sarah Connor's claims about machines from the future trying to kill her so that she doesn't give birth to a child, a child that would grow up to bring the harbinger of doom for the machines. The detectives came to Silberman to find more clues about whatever was happening, and although Silberman was now himself, a resident of Pescadero, they knew he was telling the truth. In fact, it was because he believed in the Terminators that he was turned into a patient. But he wasn't really crazy or so, I would like to believe. But knowledge that they did not like the detectives went on. Meanwhile, the three Terminators came across a gang of street thugs who thought they were just dealing with three people who lost their way. Of course, that was the last thought that these guys ever had, but in no time, the Terminators showed whose the bosses were and stole their weapons. Well, you see, it was actually the weapons that the Terminators wanted and the deaths for just collateral damage. Not very far away from here, the Connors found themselves before an FBI safe house where Teresa and her children were brought. She had tailed the feds from the Dyson house to here. Inside, Agent Spansky was interrogating Teresa about her recently deceased husband, but the woman was in no mood to talk. Her husband had just passed away and her children were left without a father. Yet Spansky kept insisting and agreed to do it later only after Teresa landed a slap on his face. Special Agent Stern went to the steel mill where the massacre took place the previous night, and she knew that Sarah Connor was also there when the events unfolded. She knew that she would find more clues about the Terminators, and guess what? She did find a functional and intact Terminator, just not in the ease she expected. The T-1000 had arrived there, assuming Stern's appearance. Stern's worst fears came to life, and the T-1000 was now Special Agent Stern. Meanwhile, Sarah wanted to see Teresa, but she was not just getting the opportunity. The hotel where the Dysons had been kept was teeming with officials, so there was no way she could just sneak in and out. She had to wait. The mother and son decided that they would wait till dawn when the security would be the thinnest before making the move. A few hours later, John decided to take a walk, and although Sarah knew that she should stop him as a mother, she didn't because she wanted John to make his own decisions if he had to become the future leader of the resistance. A few hours passed by and John did not return, which worried Sarah, but then she heard a commotion. John had bumped into the Dysons, who were trying to escape. Spassky and the other feds followed, but Sarah came just in time with her car to give her son and the three absconding witnesses a much-needed lift. To make things worse, Spassky had recognized Sarah Connor and called it in, so of course the chase was going to be hard to beat. But Spassky calling it in led to two developments. First, detectives Wetterby and Mossberg got to know that Sarah was in town and a few blocks away from them, and second, 
The Terminators also got to know that Sarah was in town and a few blocks away. Both parties were closing in on the Connors and the Dysons while they were struggling to lose the cops. The detectives reached Sarah first and Wetterby tried to reason with Sarah, trying to get her to calm down, telling her that he believed in her word about the Terminators. However, Sarah was playing cautious. She had heard all that before only to be mistaken and fooled. She pulled a gun on Wetterby asking him to back off but soon Wetterby was shot and he fell to the ground. Sarah did not pull the trigger but knew exactly what was happening. A T-800 had opened fire, killing Wetterby, and now Sarah and company found themselves almost defenseless. So it was clear to Sarah that the events at the steel mill did not help the resistance win the war against the machines, something that John had already anticipated much before. So what was gonna happen next? Judgment impaired. So the Terminators were back, and all of Sarah's hopes, prayers, and efforts had found their way down the drain. As the Terminator attacked, John and Sarah reached for cover behind their car. Wetterby was dead, so it didn't really matter anymore if he meant it when he said that he believed Sarah. His partner Mossberg was in shock. Firstly, his partner has just been killed right before his eyes. And secondly, the fears of the existence of Terminators had just turned into a reality. The Terminator opened fire on the humans, but his magazine went out. Replacing it would take three seconds, which Sarah put to good use, but it was not enough. It never is. While the T-800 was busy with the Connors, Mossberg managed to get into his car. He slammed the T-800 with it and asked the survivors to get in. While he drove off, cops came to the scene, the T-800 took care of them, and used their car to chase his targets. Mossberg was clearly scared of his bones, knowing that a futuristic killing machine was on his tail. But Sarah, ever the leader, asked him to pull it together and focus on driving. She then asked him to pull over near an abandoned construction site. While the Dysons and John were asked to find safety, Sarah came up with a plan. As the Terminator approached the humans, our man Mossberg opened fire down the Terminator, but it was simply a distraction. Sarah came down at him using a power lifter, impaling the T-800. She had managed to bring it down, but it wasn't entirely destroyed. You see, the power core was housed in the chest, so it was probably scragged, but you could not take the chances with T-800s. Mossberg suggested that they get out of there, but John suggested otherwise. They could not just leave an entire T-800 there. The T-800 CPU was the one thing they could not let the authorities have. Hell, working with only a damaged version, Miles Dyson had all but constructed the bases of Skynet, and he gave his life just to stop that from happening. So John used the tricks he had learned in a previous film to safely remove the CPU from the T-800's head. There were sirens howling outside the under construction building, but the noise of Sarah's thoughts about the return of the Terminators was too deafening for her to focus on anything else. She needed to know why they were back and now that they were. Meanwhile, Spassky called in Stern, who was actually the T-1000 to tell her about the Connors and that they had found a whole Terminator. Yes, it had taken a pounding, but it was largely intact. Meanwhile, the Connors and Dysons and Mossberg checked into a hotel because running any further in daylight meant getting caught by the cops or the feds, or worse, the machines. Sarah got time to piece things together and concluded that the authorities could learn a lot from the Terminator they just destroyed. Things like mechanical systems, alloys, and peripheral electronics, but nothing about the machine's brain, nothing that could lead them to Skynet. So there must be something else that must give them the edge. There had to be another factor that meant Skynet would still come to be. It was then that Mossberg revealed a lead that Wetterby had, network developments in Simi Valley, the place from where the feds in this case were operating. Sarah decided to go to network developments and ask Mossberg to take Connor and the Dysons to a secure location deep in the mountains. However, Teresa wanted to avenge her husband and offered to accompany Sarah. Meanwhile, people started dismantling the destroyed T-800's body only to find the CPU was missing. Stern deduced that Connor must have taken the CPU and asked Spassky to find her at all costs. She contacted the other T-800 and that's where the third issue of this amazing sequel series ended. Genesis and Revelations Well, the fourth issue started with a bang. Sarah Connor arrived at network development unarmed. How she walked through the front door, she let herself get caught by the feds, so what was the play? What did she want? Well, Spassky forgot to ask these questions to her, which was then Stern arrived and did the needful. Sarah just walked to talk, or did she? She was taken to an interrogation room, well, just a room, anyway, Sarah Connor had come so far and fought so hard, and now it all depended on her words. Here in the lion's den, her toughest fight. As she was guessing it right, there was stuff going on in the building that would somehow ensure the creation of Skynet, but a wholesale attack like the one staged at Cyberdyne would be pointless and doomed. The only way for her to win was to be open and hope that she could persuade them. Like she convinced Dyson, she could see that Spassky did not hold real authority. 
He was a doer and not a sinker. But Stern, she frightened Sarah and for the right reasons. Well, what do you know? Sarah wanted them to reveal whatever they were doing in order for her to reveal whatever she knew. As would be expected, Spassky reminded that in the eyes of the law, she was an escaped convict who had only gunned and bombed her way throughout the state. So she was not obligated to tell her anything, but Sarah could not easily be budged. She told him that if she was not told what she wanted to know and if she did not walk out of there by 4 that evening, a prepared statement covering everything she knew about Terminators, complete with corroborating police records and details of their complicity, would be disseminated to the media by mail, fax, and the internet. The news would be blown like the nuclear bomb and no one would be able to contain it. Meanwhile, the other T-800 had found a van carrying the kids in Mossberg. In fact, in the gunfire that ensued, Danny got shot. Although the T-800 was thrown off his vehicle, he latched onto the top of the vehicle. To make things worse, they crashed. On the other hand, at Network, Sarah learned that this was not the first T-800 they had found. These pieces had been recovered from around the world, the earliest one being the one found in Argentina in the mid-70s. By now, they had 27 of them, and it was believed that they were guinea pigs sent from the future. War Child God created the universe with this single building block of reality, the atom. Man inspired to break the fabric he and everything in life was created from. He split the atom, but what is even more disturbing is that the efforts he spent to dismantle the universe's ingredients were done for one reason and one reason alone, to kill everyone to destroy. And eventually, that's what happened, and the whole world died because of it. The story picked up long after the events of the previous book, and by then, the war had ravaged the world. It was dystopian, post-apocalyptic, whatever you may want to call it. Connor and Danny were still young when the world lost everything, so they did not worry too much about what they lost, but folks like Detective Mossberg, Teresa, and Sarah they lost everything they grew up around, everything that was normal. Nevertheless, John and Sarah Connor, along with Teresa Dyson and her kids Danny and Blythe and Mossberg, were checking out the wrecked landscape of Los Angeles. Their moment of reflection was cut short when a group of survivors came running towards them, hotly pursued by two relentless Terminators, or shall we say, the children of Skynet. Quick to react, they managed to take down the first Terminator without much fuzz. Then, John Connor stepped up, he snuck up behind the second Terminator, leapt onto it in a risky play, slapped a bomb on it, and scammed. The Terminator went down in flames, but their relief was brief. They then had an HK Aerial, a kind of flying hunter-killer machine to worry about. Dodging its watchful eyes, they made a break for it, hiding to catch a breath and plan their next move. We now move to the year 2029, and we find an older John Cotter leading the resistance. He's tuned into a report from Bravo Company, a squad on a mission to snag a working T-800. They've got one in their sights, described as frozen and ripe for the taking. Meanwhile, back at base, there's a buzz about a power fluctuation from Skynet. This odd glitch seems to knock all the Terminators connected to the hive mind offline for a brief moment. This catches John's attention. He remembers his mom, Sarah Connor, mentioning something about this kind of power dip. She heard it from Kyle Reese. As Bravo Company gets busy trying to sever the power line, hoping to capitalize on this rare opportunity, things take a sudden turn. The power snaps back on, reviving Terminators and leading to a tragic end for the entire Bravo Company team. It's a harsh reminder for John Connor of the relentless and unpredictable nature of their enemy Skynet. Feeling down and out, John Connor seeks some solace by visiting Danny Dyson, a go-to move for him during tough times. Meanwhile, back at the base, Samuel and Griffith can shake off their curiosity about what Danny's up to when no one's looking. Their trust in John is solid, but they can't help but be wary of Danny given his father Miles Dyson's infamous role in birthing Skynet. Their snooping leads them to Danny's computer and what they find there sets off alarm bells. Skynet's source code is sitting right there on Danny's hard drive. This discovery sends them reeling, fueling suspicions that Danny might be in cahoots with the machines. Of course, this casts doubt on Danny's loyalty and intentions in a fight where trust is as vital as firepower. Was Danny really working for and with his father's killers, or was there more to the story than that? You see, in the previous book, Danny had mentioned that he could get the machine's source code if he were given enough time. Anyway, that's the end of the first issue of Nuclear Twilight. Suicide Mission Colonel Mossberg is rallying the troops just as Samuel and Griffith join up with Reynosa, Crane, Williams, and Kyle Reese. Yes, 
Mossberg has become a colonel in the ranks of the Resistance Army, with Bravo Company's mission to capture a functional Terminator having fallen through the pressure is on for his new team to deliver results. In the midst of this, John Connor notices Kyle Reese as part of the squad set for this high-risk operation. Realizing the stakes, John quickly intervenes. He can't risk Reese on this mission. His survival is crucial for John's own past and future of the Resistance. John knows he needs Reese for a different, more vital mission down the line. Amidst these rapid developments, John receives word of another power dip from Skynet. It's a significant moment, possibly opening another window of opportunity or challenge for the Resistance. John's decision to pull Reese from the mission underscores the intricate web of time and events they're navigating in this relentless battle against Skynet. At another location, we see two Terminators heading for the time displacement facility deep underground and watch a T-800 infiltrator disappear. John has several people working to discover the secret of time travel as well. He knows he somehow has to figure it out to send Kyle and a T-800 back to protect Sarah and himself in the past. While they have a breakthrough in discovering the formula to use the time machine, a third power dip is reported. Meanwhile, the team that is going out to get an intact Terminator suddenly realizes that Kyle Reese has secretly persuaded another team member to stay behind instead of himself. Luckily, they discovered yet another frozen Terminator due to the recent power dip and immediately started working on how to disable it. While doing this, they are discovered by an HK aerial. Most of the soldiers are killed except Reese, who is badly hurt. While Griffith is walking around looking for survivors, also badly hurt, Griffith is picked up by the Terminator and stares into its eyes dead men walking. On a dicey mission to capture a T-800, Kyle Reese and Griffith find themselves in a pretty serious situation. Their teammates have fallen and they're both severely injured. While scouting for any possible survivors, Reese has to stealthily avoid a centurion robot on the hunt for humans. Back at base, John Connor learns about Reese's predicament and immediately dispatches rescue teams to find him. In a brave solo effort out in the ruins, Reese manages to take down a T-800. However, Griffith's fate takes a darker turn as he's captured by Terminators and whisked away to a covert Skynet facility. There, he faces intense interrogation by two T-1000s keen on extracting information about John Connor's strategy. As Griffith's life hangs by a thread, one T-1000 gears up for time travel, while the other morphs into Griffith's form hinting at a sinister plot brewing within Skynet's ranks. After securing the T-800, Danny Dyson gets to work, replacing its old CPU with a reprogrammed one. Danny's been toiling away on a virus for years, and now it's time to put it into action. This virus, loaded into the T-800 that they've nicknamed Rusty, is meant to spread and incapacitate the entire Terminator fleet. Team Omega Platoon, including Jude and Raphael, amongst others, gears up for a top-secret mission. Their task is to escort Rusty right into the heart of Skynet's operations, at Cheyenne Mountain's mainframe complex. But as they approach their destination, they're confronted with something they've never expected. Another resistance group, unaware of the plan, is hell-bent on destroying Rusty. Suddenly, Team Omega finds itself in a frantic skirmish, not against Skynet, but against fellow resistance fighters. It's a chaotic scene with one team fighting to protect Rusty and his crucial mission, and the other determined to take it down. In the midst of the Cheyenne Mountains, the two resistance factions clash each with their own convictions, in a tense and unexpected standoff. Father's Day. Kyle Reese is recuperating in the infirmary, oblivious to the pivotal role he's destined to play in Connor's future and that of the Resistance itself. Meanwhile, John Connor wrestles with doubts about whether Reese will step up for the critical mission he's been grooming him for. As Connor mulls over this, he's busy prepping the technician and gathering the necessary equipment to send Reese back in time. With uncertainty hanging in the air about whether the virus plan succeeded, the team sets out for the location of the time machine. The stakes are high and the atmosphere is tense as they make their move. Hoping that everything falls into place for this crucial step in their fight against Skynet, en route to this time machine facility, John Connor's team is ambushed by HK aerials, resulting in several of their vehicles getting destroyed. As they finally make it to the facility, another power dip from Skynet occurs. This time, Skynet sends back three Terminators two T-800s and a T-1000 into the past. Now you understand, it's about to come a full circle. In a twist of fate, Danny Dyson's specially programmed T-800 carrying the virus successfully uploads it into Skynet's network. The virus spreads rapidly, effectively neutralizing the attacking Terminators in the nick of time. With this momentary reprieve, John Connor announces the need for one last mission to seal their fight against Skynet. Kyle Reese steps up volunteering for this critical mission. He is sent back in time, playing his part in the intricate web of events 
that define their struggle. Despite the successful viral attack on Skynet, the battle is far from over. Terminators operating in rogue mode remain a threat. The war against the machines continues, adding to the tension the T-1000 having killed and impersonated Griffith makes a sudden appearance at the headquarters, signaling that the fight against Skynet's creations is entering a new and unpredictable phase. So yeah, that was the sequel to the second Terminator movie, and I have to admit it was something we should have gotten. Issue 0, The Programming of Fate While Kyle Reese sent to the past, John Connor faces his next crucial task. To keep his life's timeline intact, he needs to send a TA turned back to guard his 10-year-old self. The Resistance has already dealt a significant blow to Skynet by infecting the Hive Mind Terminators, but rogue Terminators still pose a threat. Inside a facility filled with T-800 infiltrators, the Resistance successfully reprograms one of them. However, reactivating it risks waking up the rest. Amidst this tense situation, the T-1000 disguised as Griffith sneaks into Danny's office, swipes Skynet's source code and slips away unnoticed. As feared, reactivating the reprogrammed Terminator triggers the others. A fierce battle erupts between the humans and the awakened Terminators. In a turn of events, the reprogrammed Terminator sides with the humans tipping the scales in their favor. After a hard-fought struggle, they gain the upper hand, defeating the Terminators. With this victory, they're finally able to send the reprogrammed T-800 back in time, completing another piece of the intricate puzzle that is their fight against Skynet. Marvelous Verdict The Terminator series is a bit of a conundrum. The original two films are bursting with creativity and character, naturally leaving fans craving more. But post-Genesis, there's this nagging feeling of wanting to preserve the legacy as is. The first two films are self-contained masterpieces. The third one, though, felt like a forced repeat of the second. The fourth movie ventured into the future war, a theme barely touched upon, previously now made possible with advanced Hollywood tech. The fifth film? It's like a remix of all the iconic elements from the first two, and beyond the movies, Terminator has been a goldmine for comic book adaptations. Since 1988, no fewer than seven publishers have taken a crack at it, each bringing their unique spin. These comics range from brilliant to mediocre, often grappling with the complexities of time travel narratives, including the amusingly frequent need to address the nudity that comes with it. Interestingly, the first comic series to expand on Terminator 2 Judgment Day didn't hit the shelves until 1995, four years after the film. This timing coincided with the year the film was set, adding a neat layer of synergy. Malibu Comics' Cybernetic Dawn rolled out as a five-issue series, issues 1 to 4, and then a concluding issue zero. Dan Abnett's handling of the characters and dialogue in Cybernetic Dawn is spot on. It's so good you can almost hear Linda Hamilton's voice in the narration. The story even brings back Dyson's family paving the way for Danny's involvement in the sequel comic Nuclear Twilight. Artists Rod Wiggum and Jack Snyder do an impressive job capturing the actor's likeness, lending a cinematic vibe to the series. While Cybernetic Dawn might feel more mainstream compared to Dark Horse's renditions, it fits snugly into the Terminator saga, feeling like an essential piece of the story. If you like our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks, everyone.